that's good. Oh, what a nice, where if you want to send that as a, as a, an extra, whoever put this one up, the woman with the flowers over her hair, you'd get five points extra credit. Um, if you send, you know, anything up to four works of art, I already gave a couple people extra credit for their artwork. Uh, you know, individual PDF, of course, so I can open them images of uh, anywhere from, well, let's say two to four in one setting is worth five points. You can do that four times if you have, and many of you do, uh, skills. Oh, Victoria, I have uh, news for you. I think you'll read. It's good. I forwarded to you about half an hour ago uh, the, the handouts that you seen before you were unable to get from my AOL because that's the much more efficient and rapid way to do it. So if you ever miss any others, I'm happy to send them to you individually. If you didn't have a chance to check, you'll see they're there. Hopefully. Yes. yes. I just, I see them right now. Oh, Thank good. You. Good. Sure. That's part of uh, what we're here for. All right. So let's just do a couple of quick announcements. And I mean, this is only because in any way that could have some bearing, uh, but it is good news is it won't have a negative bearing. My uh, recent toenail operation, I'll keep that brief, no TMI here. Uh, it went well and it didn't hurt nearly as much as I thought it would afterwards. I do have to keep my leg elevated, but that's not part of me that you guys are going to see during this class anyway. So it's underneath my little work table that I have elevated on a, on a footstool and that's it. Uh, well, I could be taking painkillers, but I decided not to do that because I want to focus and I want to be sharp as I am capable of being for you to have questions, comments, and of course, uh, to focus on the, the, the topics that we're going to cover each week. We got some interesting ones coming up. Today is uh, ancient Near East. Most people use the word Babylon to describe as a broad term that entire part of the world, which is not the whole Middle East. It, well, see, people have different definitions. Uh, I know people that think Greece is part of the Middle East. Talk to Greeks, no, it's not, but Turkey is. And Turkey had nothing to do with Babylon. Uh, Egypt, totally separate culture, but it's part of the Middle East, what we today call the Middle East. And we're gonna have a lot of interesting slides with those uh, next week, right? So our task this week is uh, Babylonian and Assyrian, that's with the capital A, sort of the forerunners of the current country or you know, ancestral roots for the modern country called Syria with, without the A. So Assyria, but mostly Babylonian art or Assyrian and Babylonian art is today's topic. We'll probably need to finish a couple more slides on uh, Wednesday and then I should be I don't anticipate any reason why not able to stand long enough that could be 45 minutes so to do during the Wednesday lecture it's an important one for you to to watch or if you somehow physically can't be here make sure you see the video on YouTube which which will be the nine elements and uh, again if anyone didn't get those you need to try uh, please send me your request through AOL it's faster it's easier for me uh, but but in any case, that's for all. I sent an email about that, but I don't know if everybody saw it. You can't, it's much more cumbersome outlook. It's just, it's not the most efficient website I've ever worked on. And I've worked in colleges that each had their own websites. The good news is the tech people here are really, really good when there's a problem. But knock on wood, my table is wood. We won't have any tech issues. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the only one we've had in the past with Zoom was, was really heavy, uh, you know, windstorms that, temporarily, you know, interrupted uh, the connection. But even then, I was able to restore them. I think I had to resend an invitation one time in what, two and a half, two years now we've been doing so. So we shouldn't have an issue with that. Certainly not going to be, unfortunately, any rain for the next two weeks, at least. Okay, but are there any questions about, I've been getting some good extra credit. And I think that to me, that is a good sign that you guys, you know, are motivated. And it also shows me that you have, uh, I often call it a passion for certain types of art. And they've been, remember, it doesn't matter what subject, uh, period or topic or artist. It doesn't have to be from the periods we're covering or the syllabus. Uh, any kind of art from early prehistoric all the way to the most modern where you find an article it doesn't have to have an illustration with it if it does it's more interesting but that's not a requirement but at least one whole page about one of the visual arts and send me either a screenshot or a link and you get uh, five points you can do that four times okay anybody have any questions about anything that we covered in the first two uh, weeks or uh, extra credit or anything else before we start the lecture Will you be uh, doing more extra credit? 
Well, the extra credit is is ongoing. So you, oh. yeah, it's on the list. Uh, if you if you haven't had a chance, I don't know if that, who that was, but for instance, I know Victoria wouldn't have had a chance yet. Maybe one other person sent me an email asking because they hadn't yet received the course grading policies. Go to the bottom of that. Actually, it's more like the top of page two. It's only a two page handout, and you'll see listed. We went over them in class, and of course, the video of that is available to look at. But it's easy just to read those. There's about six, and I'm not going to you know, rehash because we covered that the first week of class. Uh, but but I think the most entertain, entertaining, well, yeah, that's that's the right word. Um, easiest, it sounds like you know I'm pitching something, is, is to uh, watch a documentary or a, a feature film about any artist that interests you. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I, I expanded that to any subject relating to something that interests you. It doesn't have to be, again, a, something from the period we're covering. There's so many good ones, at least an hour long and write two pages about what you learned. But it's, it's best to keep it focused. And, and there's so many good movies and documentaries about individual artists or even groups of artists that you can find something interesting on one of the various networks, you know, or platforms, whatever the word is these days, Netflix, Amazon, History Channel, what of course those of you go through those platforms or or even just a DVD and actually watch it at home if you have such a player and then just write two pages and that's 10 points you can do that twice so hopefully I'll see some more of those okay that's a new one I added like last semester I think but it's it's on the, it's on the course grading policy along with the other five options the only one we probably won't do well maybe is a walking tour but there's a chance things will have subsided enough that it's, you know, an architectural tool will be open to all three of my classes and, and you would just drive yourself and you can invite a guest to Berkeley at a meeting point out if it happens, it'll be in May when the weather's good. And you get to see places you would never otherwise have a chance to see. Historic, really beautifully designed 100 to 130 year old homes or, or public buildings that are open to the public. That would be uh, you know, on a Sunday, and it would only be two, about two and a half hours, and it's worth 20 points. That's the one option that we might not have that, uh, be able to do that, because of, of course, the concerns about <sighs> two years in a row. But I don't think uh, by, by late spring, I'm going to let you know, because I think there's a good chance. Let me see, there's, here we go. Admit, good timing. We're just about to start the first slide. I was just saying that all the extra credit options are ongoing. And the only one I can't predict whether we may or may not be able to do is the walking tour. But we'll, if it happens, I'll let you know. But believe me, three weeks ahead of time, we should know by mid-April if it's safe to have a, it's an outdoor activity, but I don't want to take any unnecessary risks. Anyway, any other questions about anything relating to specific extra credit options or a material that we've covered in the first two weeks? anybody because at the end of this i may decide i need to not stick around for 15 or so minutes i may need to rest my my foot to, as per doctor's orders but right now everything's fine so now's a good time to ask questions if you have any before we get to the first slide anybody that's on the you know top of your mind okay well if it's urgent i will answer them at the end as i always have all right let's get to um, our first must know slide and I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, context before we get to the notes <clears throat> for this particular slide. Okay. And let's just make sure we get it full screen. Everybody can see this, right? I kind of gave you a little bit of, um, I call it context to background, however you want to say that, which some of which is in Stockstead, of course, but uh, I usually think of uh, ad things, I mean, aren't in the textbook. Uh, the, the ancient Near East is usually a term applied to, if you want to think of it today, we give you, if you looked at the syllabus, which hopefully you have before each lecture, so you know what slides are coming up and, and you can have read about most of them are in Stockstead, like 90% of them. If they aren't, they're on the internet. The point is that, that you should be somewhat familiar with what we're about to cover in terms of the, the individual works of art, at least their names and the period and their location. We don't know the names of the artists this far back, right? So we give a location or that's what's on the syllabus of what you'd be asked to re respond to if you have this slide on the midterm. Okay, so the locations we're talking about today, we give you the name of the current countries would be Iraq, Syria, uh, Lebanon, 
Israel and uh, sort of the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, but mostly would be like Kuwait because the, the uh, Arabic uh, cultures we're going to cover in some detail when we get to Islamic art. So mostly north of Saudi Arabia, south of Turkey and <laughs> west of Iraq. Iraq is its own culture, as you know, uh, Persian, right, is the ancient word for Iraq. So what we're seeing today, if you look at your syllabus, uh, these are, uh, I meant Iran. I misspoke already. My apologies. And it ain't the painkillers because I didn't take any. My, my uh, bad. I'll say it again. We're talking about areas that are to the west of Iran. And we uh, will just, you'll see on the list here, all of the, the locations are in what's today the country of Iraq, because that's a heartland of the ancient Near East today, even as well as in the ancient world. It was the uh, birthplace of the Babylonian Empire, but there was not only one Babylonian Empire, some say three, but at least two distinct periods. And we're gonna see the early Babylonian uh, period in some of the works we're looking at. And then the later when they ruled almost the whole area we're talking about, they had a very big empire and they challenged the Egyptians and uh, fought with them and conquered the Jewish state to what was an ancient kingdom of Israel and other places we call uh, the heart of the Middle East. The Babylonians were the most powerful culture in the ancient Near East. So let's start with this now. Here we go, our first must know. I, I always reserve the right to, you know, like I've said this before, to slightly alter the order that they appear within each week's topic. Uh, uh, so it's the second slide now. If you look at your syllabus, face of a woman from Uruk is the title. Face of a woman from Uruk is, Capra U R U K. The location is Iraq. And I think you all know that's I R A Q. All of it's to say is spelled that way. The same countries, of course, spelled that way. Uh, and the date 2100 or 2100 BC or BCE. So we'll start with the fact this is a really unusual work of art. And there's an interesting uh, footnote to it that had to do with uh, the US invasion of Iraq, which is part of the meaning I'll end with that. But let's start with the first fact you should know and uh, have in your notes. Th this slide, by the way, I always try to remember to do this, is so important I'm not definitely not gonna cut it from the study list. So you can count on it uh, being on the study list. I'm not saying it definitely will be on the midterm, but it has a high possibility. Okay, so what's the most important fact about it? This is the oldest intact, I'll say it twice, the oldest intact life-size image of a woman's head yet found in Western art. I'll say again, it's the oldest intact life-size image of a woman's head yet found in Western art. Now, there could be something older in Asia, but I'm not aware of that. It's over 4,000 years old, and it's far enough back that there, there was no written language yet. There were some kind of um, symbols. Uh, some people use the word hieroglyphics, but that usually applies only to the Egyptians. So you could say there was some kind of records kept. So is it prehistoric? It's, it's on the cusp. Just say that it could be considered uh, an example of late prehistoric art, but that most people think of as cave paintings, right? So obviously it's more advanced. So I wouldn't even necessarily call it prehistoric. I just call it early Near Eastern art or Babylonian. I've already mentioned that's the area where at the time this was carved, this, this full life-size uh, head of a woman. And by the way, the title Stockstead gives a uh, face of a woman. Uh, let's take a close look. It's more than a face. Obviously, it's the full round three-dimensional life-size image of a woman's head and neck from the neck up. So uh, every other source I've ever looked at, not just other textbooks besides Stockstead, but internet sources always call this the head of a woman, but she calls it face, so I'm trying to avoid confusion since that's the way you'll see it in your, in your textbook. Okay, so it's the head of a woman who we think some historians, just say some historians, in fact, actually, you could even say many, many historians believe it's a portrait of a high ranking Babylonian woman. What would that mean? Either she was a noble woman, you know, one of the ruling class, a member of the ruling class, or a high priestess. Those are the two most likely uh, explanations. If it's a portrait of a woman and the leading, it is the leading theory 
historians have, the majority of it, uh, including myself, would say that it, it's very likely uh, an actual individual portrait done from, from life, from, from a woman who was alive then and, and was the model for it. Why do they think that it's an individual portrait? Why do most historians think it's an individual portrait as part of the meaning? Uh, instead of a general image or you know generic image of just any Babylonian woman. And if it is a portrait, why do the, most historians think it's a high ranking woman? Well, let's see. Let's start with, what do you notice about her hair? Let's uh, lower this here. Isn't there something unusual about her hair? Anything? Styled and symmetrical. Yeah, ex perfect, excellent. Yes, that, uh, that is exactly the right way to describe it. Her hair has been styled, which clearly means that she had someone you know, do her hair for her. And that by itself would indicate that she was high ranking and, and well to do. I mean, you know, the average peasant woman or even, you know, shopkeeper's wife would probably occasionally be able to afford that, but not, not usually uh, most of the time, if ever. So that's one clue, okay, as you'd have in your notes that, that her hair has been styled, which indicates a high ranking woman. What about her gaze? You know, the way, let's get up close, her eyes. Now I know they're missing the actual eyeballs were in her, this stone, it's a piece of stone, of course, hollow carved stone that once had some kind of precious stone probably, or maybe ivory for the eyes. And those were probably stolen thousands of years ago. So, but what do you notice about the way the, uh, ex the, 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 her eyes are, you know, looking at us? Is it a normal expression of just a, you know, sort of a quiet, shy person is just, you know, not wanting to be noticed? Or is there another way to describe her, her eye, her gaze? There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. How would you describe her gaze? Anybody? She kind of looks stern and like she's like looking at you or whoever she's looking at with like a purpose. Yeah, it's very focused. If somebody else had a, a, a comment. There's no right or wrong here. I'm just asking. What, did somebody else have a, a a phrase they want to use? Okay, it's a direct gaze. That's what I would say. But you can you know write that in a number of ways. Uh, I would say it's a direct gaze, which implies in you know this again is the next thing you should have in your notes that she has some sense of her own authority or importance because she's looking directly at us. And that, of course, what wouldn't be the case with a poor woman or an average, you know, say, you know, maybe shopkeeper's wife, I keep saying it that way, but you know, we didn't use the word middle class for this period of history, but that's what we're saying there. If she wasn't upper class, she probably would, would be less likely to be shown posed this way with a gaze directly looking straight at us. Last thing, the last clue is, look at the set of her jaw and the uh, her mouth and overall then including the the gaze what how would you describe her expression on her face somebody actually used the, the the gentleman that just spoke up you said somebody said stern but if you thought of another word that might also imply something about her personality her state of mind that she's conveying with her her pose everything from the way she her eyes are and her mouth the set of her her jaw you know and the overall impression that she gives is one of a woman. Solemn. Yeah, okay. That, that... Solemn or confident. Say that last second word, sorry. Uh, solemn or conf confident. Yes, again, excellent. <laughs> yes, a strong sense of self-confidence. I think that clearly comes through. Again, we're saying that's if this is a portrait of an actual woman, she exudes self-confidence, or you could say gives the impression of having a strong sense of self. I would say self-confidence is the best phrase, but any phrase that, that is, means the same, it definitely gives that impression. Again, that's a leading theory. I usually only give you, since we can't spend too long on each slide, at least one other theory that's not maybe as commonly believed, but just could say, you can always write it this way if I will almost if there's more than one theory, I will usually at least tell you the two main theories. So the second most common theory or another theory, alternate theory, if you want to write that, is, is that it's a general image of someone, perhaps a high priestess, but it wasn't done perhaps with a uh, individual 
a person posing, a woman who, who uh, was, was having her portrait made. Well, maybe, but it just, there's so much detail here with the, again, the way the eyes are looking at us, her styled hair, the, the set of her jaw, the expression on her mouth. It, it, most historians, and definitely I would say the odds are mostly that are much greater that it, it's an actual individual person. And then probably there would be two main possible roles either, as I already said, an upper-class woman, uh, you know, from a powerful family or a high priestess who would have really important role in their religious ceremonies. Okay, one last thing about the meaning. I gave you a little teaser about the uh, Iraq war. When uh, Baghdad fell, that's before some of you, well, 2003, I see you, my daughter was born. Yeah. In fact, she was born literally a day or two after the U.S. Uh, in, invasion or whatever you want to call it, takeover, right, of, of Iraq. So just say during the fall of Baghdad or when the city of Baghdad fell during the Iraq war, this and many other works of art disappeared from the museum that owned them. But there is some misunderstanding about what happened to this. And we know now it wasn't because of chaos or riots, which there were, you know, as a city falls to an invading army, there's always chaos, right? And it wasn't even any way related to the US invasion. It was stolen by someone who worked for the museum and then stored in their backyard and it was going to be sold to a foreign, you don't have to say who it happened to be, it's German, I don't know his name, but it doesn't matter what they care. There was he was a foreigner, not in any way, even from the Middle East. It was gonna pay millions of dollars for it. I think it was 10 million, you don't have to say exactly. He said, so, so someone from the museum stole it under cover of all that chaos, buried it in their backyard, got an illegal you know, deal going, and a neighbor reported that theft to the US military, which by the time that it was discovered, they had control over the city. So some US soldiers came and dug it out of the backyard and it turned out to be intact because even though it's missing part of its nose, that was gone thousands of years ago. And I think a little bit of, actually the ears are in pretty good shape here. So the piece was found in the condition it had been at the museum and it was returned to the museum with much stronger security measures, so it's never been, uh, you know, taken or stolen since what was that? Almost twenty years ago. So that's a little footnote. You don't have to write that, but that's kind of part of the update on the meaning. Okay, let's do a formal analysis and, and get to our next must know. This is balanced, left to right, as all intact human images of human heads would be. Of course, again, like all human facial. And of course, the face is what we're looking at in the front of it here, has two eyes, two eyebrows, uh, bangs, right? That creates rhythm. Two ears, they're visible here, right? And of course, two lips. So there's plenty of rhythm. Uh, the semiotic texture, I wouldn't say any of it has semiotic texture except the hair. To me, that almost looks like it's, you know, plastered down <laughs> some kind of a, you know, pomade or whatever, some kind of a uh, chemical. Maybe the hair has some texture, but the rest is a real rough texture of the stone itself. So there isn't much similar texture, at least in the face itself below the hair. Uh, but that uh, also is what would lead to the where kind of line. Well, sculpture is always the case with sculpture. The details are created with carved line. I don't think it was ever painted. It could have been. We have no evidence of that, though. So just say the only kind of line here was carved line around the eyes, the mouth, the hair. Uh, there is no larger or smaller mass. It's a single mass, but it is hollow. You'd want to say it's a life-size hollow uh, object, this you know, size of a, an adult woman's head. Therefore, it's a single mass. Is it stable or dynamic? It's mostly stable. Look carefully at the way her head, head is, is being held as she's looking at us directly upright, the neck. Uh, and even the sides of her hair do until you get to the edges of the bangs. And the middle here, by the way, we think she had a headdress of some kind that that's missing along with the eyeballs themselves. But in any case, except for the details, of course, of the eyes and eyebrow and part of the hair, it's mostly stable with some dynamic detail. The color is a warm color and there's the only modeling on it is the lighting from the museum. And then for space, well, 
kind of covered it with mass, but you would want to write if it's on the uh, mid midterm, that it is again, a life size uh, image of a human uh, head. So it's, you know, several in Jesus, say several inches tall. And the only technique for space might be the hair. You could say that the bangs overlap the rest of the face. Okay, move on. That's another view of it looking from below, looking up. You can see the ears more directly here. Now, this is an important slide. Also, I'm not going to cut this one from the study list. Our next must know. It's the Ziegler. It's number one or top uh, on the top of the list for, for this week's lecture. Ziggurat of Ur. That's a word that might come up. And in fact, it's on your list of terms to know. So we're going to define it. Uh, but I'll spell it first and, and then, of course, give you the date. Ziggurat, Z I double G U R A T of Ur, capital U R. The location is Iraq, the country. Again, I've already spelled that. And the date here. Well, I guess maybe I should have gone to, I do owe you guys a little correction. I stand corrected, as they used to say on Johnny Carson's TV show, nobody knows what was the top TV entertainment show for 20 years. Ah, I gave you the wrong date for the face of the woman, but you should know from your syllabus, the dates on the syllabus are correct. And there's the ones that you need to know are what's on the syllabus. So going back, let's go ahead and do that. I just want to be thorough and clear. My apologies, the date for this, cross it out if you wrote what I uh, incorrectly said, because my eyesight drifted upward. So sorry about that. Is 3500 BC face of a one from Rook? So it is old enough that some historians think it's prehistoric. So that's the part I was focusing on when we started the notes on the meaning. But for the date, it's what's on the syllabus always, and it's already rounded off. If it's on the test on the midterm, you would not need to round it off to the nearest decade because it's all already rounded to the nearest century. Once again, the first slide, this one that you've already written notes, all you have to do is cross out. If you did write 2100, it's 3,500 BC or BC. I'm just trying to correct the record there. Okay, now this is 2100, 2100 BC or BCE. Again, Ziggurat of Ur, capital U R, Iraq, 2100 BC. So let's define a ziggurat. It's not a long definition. A ziggurat is a Babylonian stepped, that's with an E D, right? Babylonia is B-A-B-Y-L-O-N-I-A-N. You should know the spelling of that word from Stockstead, but any word not on the syllabus, you know have points off for misspelling if, if you get the, the word written close enough that, that me or the readers, when we grade your your uh, S, your, sorry, your uh, exams, your, your midterms or finals, you know, make sure you spell the words from the syllabus correct, but you'll have its open book, so you'll have them in front of you. But other words, we give you a little, little leeway. So Babylonian, I just spelled for you. It's, here's the definition. A ziggurat is a Babylonian stepped pyramid, comma, and I would even circle that comma because it's not the whole definition by itself. That's just partial definition. So again, first part of it is a ziggurat is a Babylonian stepped pyramid, comma, sometimes used as a fortified city, period. Sometimes used as a fortified city. Everybody got that? Okay, that's important because if it comes up on the true false section is how the definitions might appear, not all of them, but several, maybe you know, five or so on the midterm, I might say something like, a ziggurat is a Babylonian step pyramid always used as a fortified city. That'd be false with it. it. Sometimes they are, but they aren't all that way. This though was, and that's the main part of the meaning. What we know about this comes from written records. It's not prehistoric at all. There's no question that by this time, Babylonians had written records as did most of the Middle Eastern cultures, the ancient Near East. Okay, so what we know about this is that this is only the bottom level. There was three levels, in other words, and this is only the first level that survived, plus the staircases, as you can see, leading up to the main gates, three different sets of staircases. 
And then this city was, this Baba, uh, sorry, this Babylonian ziggurat or this ziggurat was used as a fortified city. Well, how did that work? Well, this is the main part of the meaning. Here's what we know on the first level, which would have been right here. Now it's a little tiny bit of the second level, but all there is is, you know, rubble from that. But the first level, which uh, probably did go out like that, would have been literally a uh, hundred, some think a thousand, uh, mud houses for the poor, the workers, the peasants, that'd be the easiest way to so say the peasants or workers, who of course would go, if it's not obvious, down those staircases every morning to work in the fields, of course, for, to create food. They were farmers, of course, at this point, or hunters, mostly farmers. So, so the, the workers or peasants would live in mud huts and often more than one family to each each hut or small house. So we can guess, I have to guess actually, we, we calculate that there was somewhere around, oh, 15 uh, to 20 people in each of those mud houses. And if you do the math, it, you don't have to be a math whiz, that means thousands of people lived on the first level where the workers or peasants houses were because they were so crowded together and each house was so crowded with maybe two families in each house. Then the second level were the skilled laborers. That's really the safest way. I, I used to say middle class, but that's kind of a modern term. So we'll just say skilled laborers' homes, which were only one family, but it could be, you know, three generations extended, a single family, perhaps extended family under each, uh, in each house. And those houses were made uh, probably of, of uh, uh, plaster or wood, a little more sturdy. They weren't made out of mud. And yet they were still kind of crowded together. So several hundred or at least a few hundred of those houses, each one could hold, you know, 10, 15 people for a large family. That meant that somewhere in the range of another thousand or so people, the skilled laborers that lived on the second level, probably around a thousand could have fit on the second level, which probably rose to about the top of the screen here. The third level, you can guess what that had, was the homes of the, of the ruling class. Those were made of stone and they were, you know, well, they also had servants living in them. So they might have had 15 or 20 people in each, but they weren't crowded together. There weren't that many, a few dozen. We think, you know, a couple, three, four dozen. Uh, and so up on that level were several hundred people. And in the middle of that third level, one more thing that you want to add to your notes is there was a temple, the city temple, where a god, they believe, guarded that city. They called it the city god. Each city had its own god. So Ur had the god of Ur, right? You don't have to write that. You can just say there was a temple in the middle on the third level of any ziggurat that was used like this one as a fortified city there'd be a temple where the uh, the god that city prayed to for protection would have been worshipped and of course priests would have lived in that temple or near it so all together in other words this could have had easily five thousand people that's pretty impressive living on those three levels some historians even put it closer to 10,000, but uh, that might be a bit high. So it was several thousand, 5,000 or more. And the last thing is, what are these little slits here? Some of you noticed that if you've been looking carefully at this slide. Um, it's an old slide. You can tell by this car. Was that a 55 Chevy? Anyway, so these little holes are windows for the archers, right? Uh, archers, there's no other word for it, right? The soldiers with their bow and arrows who guarded the city. Uh, and of course, they had to take shifts. So there was always 24 hours a day, there was uh, soldiers behind those windows. And so that means there were tunnels leading between the windows, but it wasn't a hollow structure. We can tell that by looking at the top of the slide. It was mostly solid, except for the tunnels on the first level. They wouldn't go all the way up to the top because the archers would need to be able to see and shoot down at any attackers. And of course, the stairs were how, uh, last, if you want to write this last fact about the meaning, the peasants, when they worked in the field and if there was a, a an impending or, you know, uh, attack coming, uh, you know, the, the, obviously they could see it coming from a long ways away, the, the archers, right, guarding the, each window, uh, they would sound an alarm, probably some kind of a metal horn, and the peasants would come running up the stairs, of course, hopefully drop what they were doing to save their lives to run to safety come up the stairs and then the, the the gate which is missing probably heavy metal or very thick wood gate would close so that's the 
pretty interesting, isn't it, to think of? But guess what? Here's a tip for extra credit. There's a museum in San Jose. In fact, it's right in downtown San Jose. My daughter used to call it the Mummy Museum. It's the only museum in the Bay Area with uh, real Egyptian mummies, but it also has a model of a ziggurat in a glass case, and it's a big model. It's quite big, and it shows how these these could be used as fortified cities. So if you go to that museum and just show me proof that you know you pay it's like five bucks, maybe seven if you're a student, you get a discount. It's in San Jose, and uh, you could get uh, ten points. Which it's a very interesting museum. It has dozens of mummies, including cat and dog mummies as well as human ones, child children's mummies and uh, adults, and then it has a section on Babylon. So both Egyptian and ancient Babylon or Babylonian uh, artifacts, authentic ones are there, plus models created to show what it was like when they built these things and they were new. Okay, so that's a, just a tip for those. It, it's called the Rosicrucian Museum. Don't ask me to spell it, but if you looked it up on Google, you know, Egyptian Museum in San Jose, you, you'd find it. It's the only museum in the Bay Area that has a collection like that. And that's a bit of a drive, right? <laughs> for you guys, it's what twice as far as it is from Berkeley. But it's worth it if you want to make a day out of it and, you know, see some sites and what it's, you feel it's safe. Um, okay, or you can just go on their website for extra credit and print out some of the material for five points each, each article. They have a good website, at least the last time I checked. Okay, let's do the formal elements. Now, uh, this is a black and white photo, but so, see, I, I went and looked, see, that's not very sharp. And then this one is terribly badly lit. These are some of these I found on the internet and others were from the slide librarian, which we don't have anymore. I wish she was still around. She could try to find things, extra views and better views than the textbook view. But this is the best view. So if it's on exam, you'll have this, but you see they're all black and white. However, we can definitely say it's warm. I think the photo in Stockstad shows the real color. It's a sand color. The texture is real. There's no simulated texture. It's all real rough texture of brick over stone. So what you have is two real materials, both of which are rough brick and stone. There's not a single simulated texture in this uh, slide. Then we have uh, the lines are, are called visual. On architecture, lines are like the edges. If there's no carved line, and I don't see any carved line here, uh, it's wherever the sun, the modeling is the natural shadows from the sun. So that's the modeling. There's no technique for modeling, just natural shadows. But that creates a visual line on the corner and the edges. So there is visual line in all architecture, or at least whenever there's sun shining. Okay, so there's no carved or drawn line. And then we have, it's a single mass now, but when it was originally intact, there were three levels. So you could break it down into say this was the largest mass and then the next largest was the, the second level and the smallest mass was the top level, but they're missing. So at the moment, it, it's basically a single mass. For space, it was 220 feet tall. That's pretty impressive. The entire structure from foundation to the top of the third level, 220 feet tall. So that's real space. However, there were tunnels leading between the lookout. You can just say lookout or archers windows. However, the rest of the bill of the structure was uh, solid. It's not a building, it's a structure or um, pyramid, right? So th there wasn't any other rooms or things inside of it. Uh, so it's mostly solid except for those few tunnels. And uh, it was 220 feet high. That's the space techniques. Uh, and then we have stable, well, both, because on the walls it's themselves, individuals, if you go to, from the ground on straight up to the top of each level, it would have been stable on all three levels, but the edges and the staircases, right? These two corners, and those are uh, dynamic, of course, they're diagonal lines. Okay, I think we've covered everything. Oh, rhythm. Yeah, the rhythm would be, in this case, the staircases and these uh, windows, uh, these lookouts or, or arches windows. Okay, let's move on to the next must know. This one will bring up the second definition, last well, two definitions. Uh, so it's a pretty important slide. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and say I probably won't cut it from the study list. All right. It's the third one down on your list for today's lecture. Panels from, uh, you don't have to write the word A. We just put it bull, liar, four words. Panels, plural, from bull, like it was always spelled with two L's, and liar is L-Y-R-E. 
I'll explain what it is, but briefly, it's a, it's a musical, an ancient musical instrument. The location, once again, the same as all the slides this week, Iraq, and the date is 2685. We know the year because we know why and how this was created and what the meaning of it is uh, from some written records. That's very specific. So what if it's on the exam? You'll have the syllabus in front of you anyway, but if you want to round it off, you could put 2680s with an apostrophe S or 2680. That'd be the right decade. Okay, so this is obviously ancient Babylonian, which by the way, is the first period of Babylonian empire. It was the earlier Babylonian empire we've been talking about the last three slides, verse two and this one. Uh, later on, I'll explain when we get to the last couple of slides, the Babylonians had a second golden age in which their empire was even more powerful, even larger, much later. So this is the earlier Babylonian empire period for what this was created. So what, what's a lyre? Well, a lyre was an ancient harp-like musical instrument. An ancient harp-like, not an actual harp that was one invented till, gosh, I suppose the Renaissance, um, but it's similar to, so you could say it's an ancient harp-like musical instrument. I think, no, there isn't one here. I thought, yeah, the slide up here might've added one, but that's, she <clears throat> didn't have time to do that. So there's a side view of it, I believe in, in Stockstead. But this is the view you'd have on the exam because it shows what we're looking at, which is a bas relief. Okay, a bas relief. And that's one of the three terms for today. So you see it's at the top of the second page of your list of terms. It's really two words hyphenated, ba or ba, bas, some people call it mispronounced, but it's, it's a French word, B-A-S. Well, you've got it your syllabus, I should, uh, your, your list of terms, I'm sorry. So you have the spelling. Bar relief, and here we go. It's a one sentence definition. A bar relief is a two dimensional work of art with raised figures off a flat background. A two dimensional work of art, comma, with raised figures off a flat background. It's exactly what we're looking at here. These raised figures are mother of pearl. So now you should, you know, this is the part of the meaning. So we already said what the first fact about the meaning is, is that what kind of an instrument is, is a harp like ancient harp like instrument. It had strings, in other words, uh, and sounded like somewhat like a harp. Okay, but each panel is a bas relief. These are figures made out of mother of pearl, and the back flat background that they're raised off of is painted wood lacquered as in lacquer everyone knows what lacquer is right uh, lacquered or or you know uh, painted wood with lacquer on top the black section so for instance if you get up close here you see the black areas are the flat part and that's all painted wood with lacquer on it and then each of the uh figures human or animal figures are um, raised off the back so it's a balready panel but part of the meaning is the last new term for this week is that it's in the animal style, just like those words sound, two words, animal style. Well, again, that has uh, another definition. It's not a long one. The animal style uh, was a style of ancient art in which animals were depicted with human-like characteristics and I'll repeat the whole thing, comma, and often engaging in human-like behavior, period. I'll say it again. Animal style was a style of ancient art in which animals were depicted with human-like characteristics, comma, and often engaging in human-like behavior. Well, that's exactly what we see all four panels here have, you know, mostly animals acting like humans. Uh, or mixed, uh, in this case, we'll get to each one individually. So some of them are humans, like this man here in the middle, who is either hugging or crushing two bulls with human heads. You see the human heads with the beards, same you know shape and same type of beard that the, the human has. So that is a classic example of the ancient world's animal style. And so what is this guy uh, doing? Well, all we know is that he's superhuman. 
He'd have to be. You know, some of you, right? That Bowles, I don't know if you've ever gone to 4-H or county fairs and gone to the 4-H tent. They're huge. You can't lift them up unless you're superhuman. So the guy in the middle is a super strong human being. He's half God and half human. And we know from the records about what the meaning of this piece was. This piece was created to entertain the, uh, the ruler, the you know, king of a palace and it was found in the ruins of a palace in uh, what's now Iraq. So again, the piece was part of a royal palace, you know, entertainment <laughs> system, if you want to call it that, right? Or, or some, you know, live musical entertainment in the royal palace. It, it was commissioned by the king to entertain his family and his guests. So these panels are part of the entertainment. They're meant to make you smile. They're whimsical deliberately. I mean, obviously something un totally unrealistic is going on here. Here's a human being lifting two ton, at least most, uh, many of these, right? Well, maybe it's 800 pounds of the lowest. You just say around a thousand pounds each, if you want to write that. Uh, there's no way a normal human being could lift even one of them, let alone two. So he is a superhuman, half God, half human. In other words, a hero. That's the ancient world's meaning of the word hero. Slightly different than the modern, but you know, that's sort of what uh, some Marvel <laughs> heroes are, half human and half God. Right? So just say that he's one of those rare uh, God-like humans who had superhuman strength because he was part human and part God. And the, all the ancient cultures believed in that all the way through the Romans. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks. We'll, we'll get back to that when we see some other slides in the Romans. So he's one of the few human characters. Now down here, these, these are just two animals, a lion and a jackal. And look what they're doing. They're going to a party. The lion's carrying wine, a jug of wine and a goblet of wine. And then the jackal's carrying cooked heads of his own species. Well, obviously, these are animals engaging in human-like behavior. And then my favorite panel, the musician panel, there's the lyre that we are looking at the end piece of. That, that piece there, the end of this instrument, is what we're looking at in this overall view of this slide. So here we have a donkey and a bear, and the bear is snapping his paws, I guess. You can't say fingers, right? Well, you know, but in time to the music while the donkey is playing that lyre or harp. And there's the bull head, which is where the name bull lyre came from. And then you have this uh, goat drinking wine here. By the way, goblets of wine could be either like this one, you know, flat or nearly flat or, or like a modern glass goblet. And then the last panel is, is again meant to be whimsical. I call this the two-fisted drinking goat, but you call it what you want. I mean, obviously goats can't <laughs> do anything like that. They don't have hands. But in this strange fantasy world, this goat can stand upright and drink with the best of them, right? Clutching two goblets of wine. And then this half scorpion, half human is another one of those strange creatures that fit this style we call the animal style. Okay, so that is the meaning for this whole thing. Let's do a quick formal analysis because each panel is different, but they have certain things in common. All four panels are balanced, roughly balanced. You know, the two bulls on either side of the human, superhuman, super strong human. And then these two animals, same height, same thing here with the two musicians. Some people think that this one's weighted a little more toward the left uh, because of the size of the goat. But when you add this giant goblet of, or I'm sorry, I meant a vase of, of wine, I'd say it's roughly balanced left to right. And both, uh, I mean, sorry, all, all four panels are ba balanced roughly top to bottom as well as left to right. The rhythm is pretty uh, easy to see with the beards, the horns, the legs, hands, and of course the rhythm continues on all of these animals, the repeated body parts, of course, uh, all the way down to the uh, bottom panel. Uh, it, are they stable dynamic? Look carefully, mostly stable. The animals are walking upright. Uh, this one human is standing upright in the middle, but there are dynamic details on the heads and the horns, of course, and the uh, vases of wine. Uh, so there's some dynamic features, but overall, the poses of all, all these images of these 
human or animal images are pretty much all upright till most mostly stable for space there is only one technique it's overlapping now i've had students and i didn't take points off on the midterm if they said that it looks like register line but what we know is these are supposed to be different rooms in the palace at different times when different events occurred that are being shown in this imaginary set of bow relief panels or of events that of course we know didn't really occur obviously uh, so what we have is separate scenes, each one of which has only got one technique of uh, overlapping, of course, right? The two bulls overlap the human and, of course, the various objects they're carrying, right? Uh, they overlap the musicians over the instrument and uh, over the goblets of wine, the two or the lion are carrying. So obviously the only technique for space is overlapping. I don't think there's a larger or smaller mass here, unless you maybe down here, you could say the scorpion slash man or hyphen man uh, is larger than the goat. But the others, the, the, the main figures are, are pretty much equal in size. So they're, that's another reason why they're roughly balanced. So there is semi-high texture here. It's pretty good if you get up close on the hair of, or the lion's mane and on the goblet and on the fur of the donkey and the bear. And even up here, Whoops, sorry, uh, here where you see the beards and hair, uh, that's that's semi texture, and even the scorpion has some uh, half scorpion. So there is semi texture all done with uh, carved line. This is done with carved, but then the line might have been painted. So you could say carved and or painted line, but mostly each piece of uh, inlay that is done out of mother of pearl would have had lines carved into it, and then maybe ink or some kind of you know, uh, dye was, you know, washed over it to give it the darker look. So you could say both carved, but primarily carved line was with some, um, some paint in those lines. Let's see, I think that's everything here. Uh, stable, dynamic, balance, rhythm. Oh, color. These would be neutral. The black panel background, actually, this is a little closer to what they actually look like. Now that I think about it, this might, but see there, it's a little fade, depends on where you're looking on your screen, at least on mine. Yeah, if it's on the exam, I'll show this view because you could do see the detail a little better. It's a fairly recent image I found. Uh, okay, so we'll do that. Uh, you, you can see it, that same texture and everything I already talked about, but, but this does show that there's no warm or cool tones. This is all uh, neutral. It's like off-white, mother pearl is that kind of a grayish white and the background's black. So when those two colors side by side, black shades of, of white and, and or gray together with no warm colors is considered neutral always. Okay, this next one, the next must know is head of a ruler from Nineveh. Head of a ruler from Nineveh. That's N-I-N-E-V-E-H. The location is Iraq again, as all these are today, and the date is 2300, 2300 BC or BCE. Okay, this is still from the earlier Babylonian Empire, or you can say the first Babylonian Empire, because it really were two golden ages. And this is from the earlier or first Babylonian golden age. When they had an empire, it was quite large. Um, and this would have been a local ruler, roughly equivalent to what we today call a governor. And there's something about him that I think a couple of you will notice if you haven't already, as I pointed out, there's something about the way he's, he's looking at whoever his gaze is falling on, someone who's standing or sitting in front of him. He's on a throne, right? Obviously he would be if he's a ruler. And he's listening to people, his subjects, or maybe visitors, Asking him for something. That's, of course, the whole point here. He's having an audience, is the phrase, right, with, with either some of his own uh, citizens or subjects. Citizens implies you have rights. They didn't have rights back then. So we'll just say subjects, some of his own people or subjects, or, or even visitors who came to the throne room. But there's something about his personality that shows through in his expression. But before we get to that, in case it's not clear, this is not part of the original work of art. It ended here. And some people think it might have been a full figure, which the head was cut out of or off of, I should say. That's the museum's display stand. It's made out of concrete, by the way. 
just so they can, you know, show it and, and have it displayed looking straight at us. Now, if you were to stand in front of it, and I think I do have a view of it from the front, but but the side view is 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 more intact. Yeah, there we go. See, look, it's been damaged. People stole some thieves stole the precious the stones or materials. It could have been possibly, like I said, uh, ivory. It's one theory. Another is maybe gold or any other kind of precious stone from the eyes. This is actually the real close to the real color. So it's a slide I'll use it if it's. I'm gonna say it will be. I'm not saying it's so important. I absolutely won't cut it on the set list. But right now, again, as I said, the first day of class, anytime a slide is on the syllabus, unless I cut it while we're going over that week's lecture, which I'm not doing with any of these slides this week, uh, unless I do that, you could assume it has a chance of being on the midterm. So what, what do you notice about him? Let's, let's take a look. His expression, look at his mouth, look at his eyes, even the pose or the way he's holding his his head in you know relation to someone he's listening to he's obviously listening carefully to someone so with the expression on his face i think it's most noticeable well the eyes and the mouth what uh, is a quality can but he's, what do you think you see as a quality of this ruler as opposed to some of the others images you might see of rulers from the ancient world. Anybody? There's no right or wrong again here. Mm, benevolent. Yes. Well, this is, you guys are betting a thousand. <laughs> yes. Benign or benevolent. Despot, though. Despot implies one person with all the power. Of course, there was no, you know, uh, input from his citizens unless he chose to let them. Yes. Benign, or as my aunt in Indiana call it, Begnin, B-E-G-N-I, Right, uh, I, you don't have to worry how to spell it. benign, but benevolent's a better word actually. Let's just go with it. Benevolent, yeah. He is not arrogant or cruel, as far as we can tell, because he looks like he cares somewhat, at least to some degree. He really wants to listen to his subjects when they come to him with some question or problem. He appears to have some empathy. That's another way to say it. But I think benevolent is is, is a good word to use. He would be a benevolent despot, meaning uh, as opposed to arrogant ones who, of course, actually we're going to talk about a couple before we finish with this week's topic, who had nothing but disdain or, uh, you know, uh, you know, cruel thoughts about their own subjects and didn't care. Like Henry VIII <laughs> in England, for instance, had no, no empathy for anybody. Uh, he seems to have some empathy and therefore make him a benign ruler or in this case benign despot um, okay one other fact about or two two other facts about the meaning that show up here the headdress is very fine tooled leather it took a lot of it would have taken a lot of work to make this headdress and when you have that fine a leather you know you can say fancy leather if you just want to keep it simple but tooled as in t-o-o-l-e-d leather and the hair tied up in the back in a bun is an indication of a ruler. In fact, he's wearing what uh, in Babylon was considered a ruler's head dress. That marks him as a ruler in case we did already know from the other evidence, but we do. We know that he was like the local ruler, meaning roughly like a governor of a province, Nineveh, which is in the heart of what's now Iraq. Still there, I think the city of Nineveh is still uh, called that in modern Iraq. And one last thing about the meaning is his beard. You're going to hear this several times throughout the first half of the semester up until the midterm. The longer a beard on an ancient image of a, of a you know, person, particularly a ruler, but any, any ancient figure, a human you know, uh, image, the longer the beard, the wiser and more important the person was. It's symbolic of that fact. And the Egyptians believe that the one culture in the ancient world that didn't was the Romans. In the early days, they did, but when Rome became an empire, they kind of, for some reason, most of their emperors didn't have beards. Well, half of them anyway. So that's the exception, but all the other ancient cultures believe that if they were portraying a person in a portrait like this is a bronze sculpture, of course, it should be obvious it's bronze, right? Cast bronze. Uh, they're going to make the beard look, you know, longer, and, prom and look how ornate or how fancy it is. This beard has been, you know, uh, 
somehow you can say style there we go it's been a style but even if it was just a normal bushy beard the longer i'll say it again a beard in a figure an ancient uh an ancient world up until the romans the more powerful sorry you can hear my dog in the, background, the more powerful and important that person was i would hope my daughter would grab my dog by now but <laughs> sorry <sighs> yeah, <clears throat> sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. All right, so this is an important and powerful ruler. Uh, we actually know who he was, but we don't maybe know his name, but we know what part of ancient uh, Babylon he ruled over, uh, a province called Nineveh. And the beard proves that he was a ruler, as, as does the headdress, the two together. And then even the hair style, having it... Uh, in a bun in the back. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. Now this is a warm color. It's a real color you're looking at. Uh, bronze color, uh, kind of a brown bronze. Bronze can be, of course, uh, more gold in some uh, <coughs> works of art, but here it's it's a warm brown. Uh, the texture is really good, isn't it? Superb on this leather headdress. It really looks like real leather. And on her, uh, sorry, his beard, mustache, and I even say on the skin, although there you do get some of the real texture, so it's both real and submitted on the skin, on the face, because it's the real smooth texture of bronze, and of course, that is simulated skin texture. All the textures are done with carved line, of course. It's, it's a given with any kind of uh, metal sculpture that the line was originally carved from a mold. Uh, the largest mass, it's a single mass. I, I, I don't think you can break it down. Uh, for space, it's a life-size human head, but with the beard, it's longer than most human heads. So as it now exists, we don't know for sure if it was shoulders, let alone the rest of the body. So what you see in this slide, this is roughly a foot and a half, about close to 15, I mean, sorry, 18 inches from the bottom of the beard and the top of his headdress, but it's a life-size figure. However, there is a technique for space. Obviously there's overlapping. The headdress overlaps his uh, you know, forehead and, and scalp and the beard overlaps his face. Uh, the modeling is just the lighting from the museum. And I would say, again, this is mostly stable because of the way the beard you know, kind of is upright and he's holding his head straight upright. And then there's almost a uh, horizontal you know, at least the overall shape of the, I mean, that shape of the line or placement, there we go. The overall, sorry, placement of his headdress is more stable than dynamic, but the top of his head and obviously the hair in the back of the bun and, you know, the, the details of his face, of course, are dynamic, so, so it's both. And it would be balanced. When it was intact, here we'll take one more look at this, uh, vandalized image. You can see the beard and the eyes when they were intact, of course, the two halves of his uh, ruler's style headdress, the two lips uh, would have made it totally balanced, of course, as well as creating a lot of rhythm. And again, you see why I say it's more stable than dynamic because of the pose, but yes, plenty of dynamic details on the parts of the headdress and uh, the eyes and the lips. Okay. How are we doing on time? Well, let's do one more slide. This is a pretty important one. Now, this one I won't be cutting. The next uh, must know. Steely, or some would say Stella, but that sounds like a character from Streetcar Named Desire, but that play, some of you may know, or the movie version. It's spelled the same way as the woman's first name. S-T-E-L-A. Steely is how it's pronounced of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was a ruler from, of course, ancient... Babylon, and that's spelled H A M M U R A B I. H A M M U R A B I. Don't give it two B's or you'll turn him into a rabbi. He wasn't Jewish. Right? He was the emperor or king of, again, the earlier uh, during his lifetime, he was the ruler, the, the uh, ultimate ruler, right? Uh, of the Babylonian Empire during its er early period. You know, in his day, he had all the power in that part of the world. The location, of course, again, it's what the modern country today is called Iraq, 1750 BC or BCE. Okay, so we're looking at a giant piece of stone that you can't see diddly on, right? So you might say, why am I even showing it to you? Well, because it's in the Louvre in Paris is part of the meaning. This was, well, there's no other word. It was stolen <laughs> by French 
I think it was Napoleon, but anyways, it's French uh, archaeologists who were probably working for someone like Napoleon. Who they were given, you know, orders to take it away and put it in the museum in Paris. I don't know why, but it has never been returned to the modern country of Iraq. It's still in the Louvre. This is my own slide. I took this. But if it's on the exam, I just want you to see it's huge. It's 15 feet tall, but it's only the top part. Whoops, wait a minute. Now we're there we go. That's it. That we're going to study. So if it's on the exam, this is the view you'll have. And this is one that I won't cut because they said a moment ago from the study list. It's a really important uh, work of ancient uh, Near Eastern art. So why is it that important? Because it's the oldest example of a law book, or some would say law codes, because it's not really a book, but it's kind of like an early law book. So you can say it's, the, again, the oldest example of an early form of law book or law codes that has yet been found in Western art. Again, there may be something older, but not that we know of. That's a pretty important point. It's nearly 4,000 years old, and it has the laws of that kingdom, which of course was ancient Babylon, carved into it below. So here's your last new term for today, for this week, actually, I think, is uh, steely. There it is at the top or near the top of the second page. Again, of course, it's spelled for you already. A steely, uh, you can pronounce a Stella if you prefer, because phonetically that's what it looks like. A steely or Stella is a uh, large, piece of stone carved with an important scene, uh, of course, repeat this, from that culture's history, comma, sorry, a large piece of stone carved with an important scene from that culture's history, comma, and often with writing below. There's your writing. These are the laws that the king of the Babylon at that time, and of course, we know who he was, Hammurabi, wanted enforced. These are the laws and the punishments for breaking them. So that's what we call, today would call law books. The law codes are, of course, printed in books now, as well as obviously <laughs> uh, in digital format. Uh, but I still think most people I know that go to law school still have to actually read the amount of books, at least part of their, their education uh, to get their degree. Uh, friends of mine who've gotten law degrees in the last five years still had to read law books. So this is like an early form of law book, and it's the oldest one we have found yet in the Western world. It's pretty important, but that doesn't exactly tell us what's going on here. Uh, what we do know, as I just said, is that these are those laws, and they're in the ancient Babylonian language, which by this time they were, you know, uh, well uh, documenting their history. They were recording things very carefully. So we don't have to guess, you know, who this guy was, but who's the other person? Well, actually, let's start. One last question now. Of these two figures, one of them is a god and the other is Hammurabi. Can anybody say which one is the god and which one is, is the ruler in this uh, scene? The one on the throne, because that's the position of more power. Exactly. Gosh, you guys today, perfect. <laughs> exactly that. And that's really important to remember, because you'll go, uh, see some other slides later on this semester, where there are a human and uh, divine, they call them, or God, uh, not God-like, but actual gods uh, shown with humans, always the more powerful. And of course, whenever there's a ruler with someone who is just a citizen or subject, like you don't want to say citizen, you know, someone that they rule over, the, the person who's seated will be the ruler. Yeah, exactly. I said it just right. This is always the case with ancient art, not just in the ancient Near East, but the whole ancient world. The more powerful person would be shown seated in the presence of the less powerful one would be standing. So that's Hammurabi, and that's the lawgiver God. Now, they had a name for him I probably couldn't even pronounce in ancient Babylonia. You don't have to know that. Lawgiver God, they would call him. There are other clues besides that really obvious one. For instance, he's wearing a divine headdress. That's a spiral style headdress. Whereas Hammurabi is wearing the same kind of headdress we saw in the ruler from Nineveh. You notice that it's hand tooled, hard hand tooled leather. And then we have the beards. Uh, Hammurabi has got a pretty good beard going there, but this guy, the king, the god, I'm sorry, the, the log of has a much longer beard. So again, that's a symbol that he's more powerful and more important. Then we have this staff or scepter. You can use either word, a staff or scepter, which he is handing 
to, or in other words, it's a symbol of authority. So that means he has the more powerful position and he's granting some of his power or authority to Hammurabi. Why? Because he wants him to go down, back down. Supposedly this is happening somewhere up on a mountain or something. Go back down to his people, his, his subjects, and tell them these are the laws you must obey. So that's what supposedly this scene depicts. The lawgiver God has called the king, Hammurabi, up to his, you know, just say his mountain top, you know, and he's telling him what laws to enforce. And he's giving him the authority, since he has that power to do so, he's handing off the authority to enforce those laws, symbolized by this staff or scepter. Finally, if that's not enough, you have the throne. I mean, there's plenty of symbolism here. People who couldn't read, most people couldn't back then, of course, would have understood the meaning of this by looking at these symbols. There's his throne, and then there we have these. This is not Janet Jackson's halftime wardrobe failure from how many years ago was that? The Super Bowl. Uh, this is this is rays of divine energy coming out of the body of a god. They wouldn't come out of a normal human. So we have a king, powerful as he is, he's not as important or as powerful as the god and he's accepting the authority to enforce these laws, which then are printed down here, I'm sorry, not printed, <laughs> published, I started to say, which are carved, I'm sorry, into this bottom part of the stele. There are hundreds of these laws. And then copies were made, if that's the last part of the meeting now, if it's not obvious, copies of this were made and sent all over the Babylonian empire to each local ruler, each governor, like that guy from Nineveh, he probably had one of these in his palace so that they would know the laws they were supposed to enforce in each of their regions or their provinces. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. All right, let's do a form analysis and then we'll call it a day. Balanced, I would say roughly, because the heights of these figures are the same, but this guy is wider, so you might, I wouldn't dispute if, 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 if some of you would see it as slightly unbalanced or somewhat towards the right. Then we have the rhythm, of course of the uh, robes the two are wearing, of their beards, uh, and of course their arms, hands, right, uh, and bodies. Uh, and then we have carved line crates, all of the similar textures, and there is similar texture on their beards, on their robes, on their headdresses, and even on the throne, very Art Deco looking throne. And then finally, uh, oh, what, sorry, I meant modeling. We still have, what, three or four more, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, it's within the lighting of the museum. I just showed you it's on display in a large hallway in uh, a museum in Paris called the Louvre. So it's not actual technique of modeling isn't present. It's just the lighting that creates the shadows in the museum. Okay, and then we have for space, the only technique is overlapping. For sure, the largest mass is the god and then the emperor. Uh, and then let's see, what else have we got here? I think that's, am I missing something? Oh, the color is, is neutral. It's a very dark black stone, which you could see from, right, this slide here. Sorry, it's black and that, that is definitely not warm or cool. It's a uh, <clears throat> neutral color. And then um, we don't have to, I think that's about it, right? Balance, oh, stable or dynamic, sorry, last. It's almost entirely stable, except for their headdresses. He, this king is uh, standing upright, I'm rabbi, and then the, law, the uh, lawgiver god is seated at almost a straight right angle. So only dynamic details are headdresses, of course are and somewhat uh, one of Hammurabi's arms, and I guess the lower arm of the law king god, but those are details, it's mostly stable. Okay, we're right at 415, and I have to tell you, I'm gonna have to sign off because uh, <laughs> it's starting to get a little bit of, a, <clears throat> uh, you know, something down on my toe, I need to get elevated more than it is. But is there an urgent question anybody has? I don't want to just cut people off before we sign off and call today. And then I'll, of course, see you all at uh, about 302 on Wednesday. Anybody have any urgent question? You can always email me, of course. And if you are missing any of the handouts, uh, for instance, the nine elements, I think I've sent them individually as well as a, as a group to everybody by now. But if you didn't get them, then Follow up with an email to my Mark W. Remember, that's the most reliable way and quickest for me to give you individually any missing handouts that you need. Uh, okay, so if that's the case, you'd get them by, uh, well, today I can't because I have another three hour lecture shortly, uh, but on Tuesday. 
And so we will go over the nine elements of composition. Now, if my foot's bothering me, we might put that off till Monday, but we still have, you know, other slides to cover, remember, and they're pretty interesting ones, the next two must know slides. So if, if for some reason we don't get to the nine elements on Wednesday, we'll do them Monday by next Monday, I'm sure that we no problem, but we'll probably get that done as well. And then maybe slightly early on Wednesday, but we'll have a, you know, regular class Monday. So I assume I'll see you all about 302. Anybody, one more time, anybody have any other questions that are urgent? Okay, I'll see you all. Uh, have a good afternoon, good evening. Okay, see you on Wednesday. Bye. <laughs> have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.